All right, we're gonna talk about fundamentals of economics. So you should have out your packet uh, and be filling this in as we go along with our notes. And step one, we're gonna talk about the definition of economics. So say that aloud to yourself and go ahead and write it if you already know it. If you don't, I'll give it to you in a second. Economics is the study of the allocation of scarce resources. So the argument is there's never, there are unlimited wants and limited ability to get those wants. And economic studies, how people make do with that. How are resources given out that we don't have enough of that are scarce? Scarcity. What is scarcity? Situation in which our unlimited wants exceed our limited resources. So economics is really the study of scarcity and how we handle that as a society. And different types of societies handle that in different ways. Next step is to define and give examples of the four productive resources or factors of production. So if you will, on one, two, three, four, I want you to define and give examples of those. And let's do that for a restaurant. Our four are capital, entrepreneurship, land, and labor. And for a restaurant, uh, land would be your location or your building. And uh, labor would be your workers. Capital would be loans or physical things that help you make a product. So if we're talking about a McDonald's, the fry machine, um, a cash register, tables, silverware, things like that. And entrepreneurship is the person who uh, is the owner or inventor and who uh, makes the profits. Also, any advertising is considered entrepreneurship. So billboards, TV ads, those things are considered entrepreneurship as well. Let's go through the payments for each of these. The payment for land is rent. The payment for labor is wages. The payment for capital is interest, usually because even if you buy tables and chairs and things like that, you need a loan to be able to do that. And the payment for entrepreneurship is profit. So make sure you have those noted as well. Opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the next best alternative that's given up when individuals uh, make choices. So for example, um, it's not everything that you give up. It's the one thing that you are most likely to do instead. And it's not the time that you gave up or the money you gave up. It's the thing that you would be doing that would bring you happiness with that time or with that money. So to go through an example, um, you know, it's the single best alternative to your action. So just one thing is opportunity cost, not all things. And that really trips students up on multiple choice. Um, but to give an example, is your opportunity for being in class today, talk to a partner about what that might be and then share some of those with your teacher. Uh, pause for a second. Again, it's the one thing you would most likely be doing. So playing pro football is probably not an opportunity cost for any of you in class right now because you're not old enough to do that. Uh, but something like sleeping in, studying for a final, uh, working, things like that would be your opportunity cost. A PPC, this is a graph that shows opportunity cost and we look at two different products. As you can see on your chart, PPC stands for, and I want you to underline the three words there, production possibilities curve. And I want you to draw one. Uh, and remember, production means things that you make. So you might draw one for, let's stick with the McDonald's theory. If you drew one for McDonald's, you might have fries and burgers on the two axes. Here's another classic PPC for an economy, and it compares guns, which means military things, with butter, which means social things. So in our country, we could produce tanks, uh, any kind of military equipment, or we could produce things like roads, schools, and so on. And so the production possibilities curve shows your options. If you only produce butter, you would produce out here on the line where they intersect. If you only produce guns, you would produce here. And if you produce any combination, here would be a country that's more militarily based, so they're gonna produce more guns. Here's a country that's more society based, they're gonna produce things like schools and uh, social services. Here's a country that's balanced in the middle, okay? North Korea is gonna be a little closer to here. Uh, European nations like France, uh, or particularly Japan, would be right here. Okay, 
And the U.S., eh, we're probably, uh, I'd have to look at the numbers, we're probably about, about here. Right here is a country that's not producing up to its maximum. So Russia would be a good example. They produce a good deal of military things. They produce a good deal of social services. But they also sort of push a lot of money that could be used to produce things back to oligarchs that make a lot of profit off corrupt government funds. So they're behind the PPC. In front of the PPC is something that's impossible for a country given the resources. So this point X is something that this country, as represented by the PPC, uh, could not do. So uh, spending, say, $10 billion to produce, you know, build 500 new roads and 1,000 new tanks, couldn't do it with the resources that we've been given. Now, you can have a growth in a PPC, um, and that would be due to some sort of new technological situation, or perhaps in this case, the country raised taxes. So you would have a whole new curve that's drawn, and the impossible might become possible. And the things be below it would now be inefficient, just like this letter A here. Marginal cost versus marginal benefit. This is the idea that... Marginal cost is the cost of one more item. Marginal benefit is the gain you get from one more item. So, for example, if Jose studies 20 more minutes, he'll increase his exam grade by 10 points. His cost would be that 20 minutes of time. His benefit would be the 10 points on his exam. Now, we don't care what he did an hour before this. Uh, we care about adding that additional 20 minutes. So, you know, the cost or benefit may be up to Jose's needs. If he has a 95 in the class, this benefit of 10 points isn't going to affect his average very much, may not be worth it. If he has a 65 in the class, this is definitely something that he should do. You should take actions where the marginal cost and marginal benefit are equal or the benefit is better. And we'll look at that a little bit more in personal finance. Here's another example. John bought a car for $500 and replaced the tires for $300. He can now sell it for $700. So if you pause, add up how much he spent on the car already. You should have $800. And he's going to sell it for a loss if he wants to sell the car. But if he replaces this transmission fluid for $40, he can sell the car for $750. So the marginal cost, doing one more, is $40. The marginal benefit is $50. So even though he's already in the hole, he'll actually cut his losses a little bit. He should replace the transmission fluid in this case because the marginal cost of $40 is less than the marginal benefit of $50. So this is something, a good and what's considered a rational decision where the marginal benefits exceed the marginal costs. Notice that we ignore the past cost of the tires, and that's something that trips students up. You want to look at, you know, something that's already done does not matter, okay? Think about you're standing in a long line, and a new cashier opens up, and somebody else moves over there. You know, should you change lines? Well, we're going to discount the amount of time you spent waiting in line, and just look at what's the cost and benefit of continuing to stand in line where you are. And as you know, sometimes that's hard to guess. Specialization. Pause for a second and talk to a partner about specialization and how specialization can help everyone out. Okay, if we use a school example of specialization, Ms. Peacock specializes in teaching economics while Ms. Sumner specializes in teaching biology, and were we to switch up, neither of us would be nearly as good. The graph that shows this is uh, the graph for uh, absolute and comparative advantage. It helps show what the opportunity costs are of changing from your specialty and where you should specialize. Uh, another example here of specialization, assembly line. One person, you know, handles screwing in this screw and the next person assembles a piece and so on. So each person has a small job and the labor is divided out. It increases your efficiency because you be can become an expert. In the years that I've been teaching economics all day, I've become a much better economics teacher than when I was teaching economics and world history and European history and humanities because I was able to specialize and therefore improve my output and test scores. 
This is going to increase our productivity and it's going to increase marginal benefit because I can focus on economics. I can benefit a good bit more and I measured that by test scores and it was very clear.